This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Look ahead, develop your strengths, develop and improve your coping skills and mechanisms, function at a healthier level as quickly as possible, and achieve independence as quickly as possible. Valeria Tellez interviews Pat Kappel, a psychotherapist, counselor, and coach revolves around emotional needs. Born and raised in South Africa, Pat is now based in London, UK. He completed a bachelor's in psychology and drama and followed that with a teaching diploma and a postgraduate degree in counseling psychology. After 17 years in the classroom, he decided to return to the books and complete a diploma in psychotherapy. He decided to train in the human givens method, which is aimed at being short-term, solution-focused psychotherapy. He continues to work part-time in a secondary school where he teaches English literature. The rest of his time, he works as a therapist, counselor, and coach. He also delivers training, workshops, and lectures in the school environment for pupils, parents, and teachers. Meet Pat at patkappel.co.uk. Here is the interview with Pat Kappel. In your own words, who is Pat Capel? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's quite mm-hmm. that's quite a start. Well, yes. uh, I'm a teacher and a <laughs> psychotherapist, um, as you can hear, of South African origin. And my South African background is a major, major part of who I am. Lived in the UK now for about 21 years. So I've had my professional life in the UK is much, much longer than it was in South Africa. Um, But sort of part-time teacher, part-time psychotherapist, counselor, coach, love my work, both the classroom and the work I do privately with, you know, individuals one-on-one. Yeah, that's me, I think. I'm not, well, I think I would call myself relatively ordinary. (laughs) Um, Not one of those really out there people. I kind of just get on with it in my own little space. I guess I'll ask you this question now. Why did you choose to become a psychotherapist? Um, well, it, it actually, I think, goes back a long time without me even realizing it. I'd always wanted to be a teacher. My mother will, will say that ever since she can remember, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a teacher. <laughs> and then as I got sort of into my late teens, I developed an interest in psychology. So I did my, my degree is in psychology and drama. Right. And then I did a postgrad in counseling and started my teaching career as a school counselor. And that unfortunately went by the by. The by. It was a temporary role. I was feeling somebody was on long leave. And the way things were going in South Africa at the time, to have a counselor in a school was unheard of. Not unheard of, but it was very rare. Right. Yeah. So I ended up being just a, you know a typical classroom teacher. I taught English for many, many years. Yeah. And then... After being in the UK for about 10 years, a friend of mine introduced me to the style of therapy that I that I went and trained in, and it kind of sparked my interest. So while I was teaching, I went back to the books and retrained and qualified in early 2016. So in a way, is um, the profession, what do you do, finding you? So I hear that a lot, and I love when that is the case. Yeah, I, th- I also think what happens is we sometimes get to a certain age 
and the rat race and the normal day-to-day jobs that we all do and we do so well and we enjoy them suddenly i think we get to the stage where we think i actually want a bit more maybe um and you know i've I've always loved working with teenagers uh, you know being a, a, a secondary school teacher and this came to me at the time when i realized there are so many teens who they're not lost, but they're floundering um, in a very pressurized world where they keep hearing bleak stories about there's nothing out there for you. You're going to get your degrees and struggle to find work. And I just thought these kids need maybe somebody in the classroom can offer them a little bit more than just the run of the mill academic school education. And so the two things just happened at the same time. I was very, very lucky. And then the school were fantastic in that they paid for me to qualify. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah. I was so lucky, very, very lucky. So do you believe in the purpose of life, of finding our purpose? Yes, I think we all, uh, we have a purpose, but sometimes we don't know what that is. Yeah. And very often, I think with teenagers, um, they told what their purpose is. Yeah, right. Um, you know, you know, you know mums and dads and schools and whoever else will say to them, oh, you know, you're a top student, you should be a doctor, you should be a chemist, you should be a lawyer. Um, And I don't think they always have the the skills to make their own decisions. I don't think they always believe they have the right to make their own decisions. Um, And, you know, Mm -hmm. mum and dad are mum and dad, but it's not their life, it's yours. And, you know, the more we can empower kids to realize it is my life, I've got to find my own way. Yes, I need help along the way, whether it's financial help, emotional help, whatever it might be. But ultimately, I'm only really going to be happy if I'm doing what I love to do. I love that you are in the field of helping teenagers to... Oh, teenagers are such fun. Um, Yeah, Children, right, in general, yeah, like yeah, young. They're a constant source of entertainment. You never know what they're going to say next. <laughs> yeah. They don't have a filter. They <laughs> say things that they shouldn't say. Um, they are so honest. Um, and yet they, they are very often just crying out for help or guidance, not just help, or, but guidance. And they don't always get it. Yeah, talk to me about that, how you teach them to find their way in the world. Uh, For me, it's all about confidence. Um, And if they don't have the confidence, then everything for them is just too difficult. And so in the classroom, you know, I, for me, it's, I want them to know, not just the, the, the information and the facts, but how do I find that information? How do I put that information down into a logical, coherent essay? If I make a mistake, it's not a problem. Um, I make a mistake for a reason, and that is to learn. And, you know, I tell them, I love it when you fail. Failing's fantastic. You just <laughs> got to learn. Why have I failed? What did I do wrong? How do I fix it? Right. Um, and if they feel the confidence that I'm not going to have a go at them if they make a mistake, that I don't mind if they get zero, right. uh, I really don't care. Um, mm-hmm. And I tell them all the time, I don't care. Mm-hmm. All I want you to do is to understand how to do it, why I'm doing it. I mean, I don't set much homework. And, you know, for me, I, for, the golden rule is if I can't tell them why I'm giving them a piece of homework, I have no right to giving them that piece of homework. Yeah. If I can't show them the value and the purpose of that piece of homework, then they should not be given it. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that has got me into trouble a few times. But <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> generally speaking, um, people <laughs> buy into that because, you know, if you set homework, you've got to mark it. Yeah. And if you're setting something useless, to mark it is mm. useless. Right. right. And our time is so precious. It's got to have a value of some sort. Talk to me about mental health. How do you define mental health? What is to be mentally healthy from your perspective, Pat? Functioning in a way that is optimal for you as an individual. Mm. Functioning in a way that you feel happy, confident, at ease, confident to take a calculated risk, but it's about you as an individual. Um, You've got to feel it. I can't tell you how to feel mentally healthy. 
I can tell you the criteria that we can use to gauge whether you're mentally healthy. But ultimately, mental health is about the individual functioning at their optimal level. And the only way you can do that is to figure out what might be preventing me from functioning at that optimal level. Yeah, what is happiness to you, Pat? How do you understand that word? What is to be really happy? Uh, being secure, feeling feeling secure and comfortable. Um, so even if you're living in very difficult times, um, if there's a way that you can feel some kind of security in that difficult place, you can still have a level of happiness. If you can learn to cope with the you know, the difficulties that life throws at you, if you know how to deal with them, you can still be happy. Wow. Yeah, and, and that comes with, you know, having all the necessary coping skills, all the techniques that you can use, you know, knowing this area, I, I can't make it any better and I'm, I can't deal with this, therefore I need to get out of it and find something better. It's I think happiness yeah. is just feeling at ease, at peace, comfortable with you and mm -hmm. those around What came to mind was resilience and inner peace. So being able to rely on our own selves within. Yeah, you, and if you mm -hmm. can't rely on yourself, yeah. you know, that's a bit of a problem because then nobody else can as well. I mean, yeah. the, <laughs> the, uh, the metaphor I use all the time is, you know, in the aeroplane, what do they tell you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Fit your own oxygen mask before you fit anybody else's. Right, right. And, you know, you've got to be comfortable and strong and empowered before you can help anybody else. And that's, a, that's part of happiness, too. And that brings me to the topic of emotions, emotional needs and emotions. Do you connect happiness or this kind of happiness to emotions and feelings or knowing how to manage them? Yes. And also knowing, um, you know, what are my innate emotional needs as a human being? What do I need to be emotionally happy and emotionally at ease? And so what I often do is, you know, I've got a what I call an emotional needs audit. Yes. And I ask my clients to to rate themselves on on a list, on a criteria. And, you know, if we if we can see, well, hang on, that need is not being met, that opens the conversation. As in, well, why is it not being met? How, what can I do to make sure that that need does get met? Am I living in a situation where, do you know what, that need is never going to be met? Now, does that mean I've got to change the situation? Or is it a matter of, well, okay, it might be that that need is not being met now, but I can see I can get it met in the future. Having that sense of hope, I think, isn't it the word? Would you use hope as a... I, yes, I do. Uh, but, you know, sadly, there are some people who feel so hopeless mm, or feel yeah. that there is no hope. Yeah. And then you've got, to, you, you've got to find a way to get through that barrier. And that's very often where you then got to dig around and go, well, okay, now you're feeling so hopeless. And sometimes we feel hopeless because we forget what we've got. We forget our own resources. We forget our own skills. And so in a conversation with me, I try and pull those out. And once you remind people of what they've got, what they've achieved, what they've learned, suddenly there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But if they, if they are so down, they, they can't see that. That makes me think about gratitude. Would you say it's a component of that, just uh, cultivating gratitude? And patting yourself on the back. <laughs> ah, well, you're right, right, giving yourself credit. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we, we don't do that enough. True, uh, I agree. I think, we, I think we, often, yeah. we often brought up to say, you know, don't tell everybody how good you are. Mm. Well, well, okay, but you can tell yourself how good you are. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. You know, I ask the question a lot about self-love and unconditional self-love. And I talk a lot about it, write about it. Do you believe that is um, actually a realistic goal to get to a place of unconditionally loving ourselves? Well, that's acceptance, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, mainly. And, and, and that's when you can only, I think, have that sense of unconditional love and self-acceptance if you feel happy, if you feel secure, 
if you feel that you are noticed by others, that you mean something to yourself and to other people, then it all kind of fits in. But I think you, I, I, I would think I'd be a little bit nervous of striving for self-love at the expense of everything else. It's all so closely mm. intertwined. You know, we are social beings. Yeah. We are designed to be in a group. I agree. We're designed to have others around us. We are designed to, uh, you know, live with others, feel with others, have their acceptance, accept them. So I, th- I think it all fits together. The way I see self-love is by learning to accept and love ourselves, we're able to do the same for others. And Absolutely. that's connect much better when, in a deeper level. Yeah. But some people, they confuse that. For some reason, when I ask the question, they confuse that with selfishness. Self-love becoming something that's negative, actually. And now might be a perfect time to talk about narcissism. Oh, yes. Yeah, so t- <laughs> talk to me about the difference between self-love and selfishness and even having narcissistic traits. Well, I think that the issue with narcissism that we've got to be so careful of is it's it's a word that gets thrown around so easily uh, lately. And I think too easily without really understanding it. Um, You know, there's there's narcissism, somebody who just thinks a bit much about themselves and is kind of out for themselves versus, you know, the individual who's got quite a serious personality disorder and is, you know, that narcissistic personality. Uh, There's a difference. And I think we all have moments where we are very self-motivated. Now, is that narcissism? Mm. Whereas the person who is totally so self-absorbed that they cannot understand anybody else's needs, that they can only see their perspective um, and that everything they do, never mind at what cost to anybody else, is all about them. There's a big difference. And, you know, I, you know, have had very close dealings with, you know, a narcissistic a uh, family member, you know, who's got the full-blown narcissistic personality disorder. Wow. And it's really, really difficult to live with. Very, very difficult. And it only, it took me into my, wow, late 40s uh, before I really learned how to deal with it. And it was a, a fantastic learning experience. And it changed my life. It absolutely changed my life. How is that possible? Like in your case, your mother... How did she do it? What is that about that person that chooses to engage with somebody like that who only cares about themselves? Well, I think that the the problem sometimes is that we don't realize who or what the other person is. And, uh, you know, it can be a matter of, you know, the the narcissist is so good at flattering Mm. the other person. And what we discovered was, you know, that, that, you know, my, my father had made himself totally dependent on our mother, yeah. but that was the ultimate control yeah. Oh wow! Um, mm. where he couldn't even cook a meal for himself. So everything mm. evolved around him and yeah, yeah. And it was, the control was unbelievable and it took a long time for us to realize that, but you know, they are so good at gaslighting people. They are so good at manipulating. Um, and I don't think we, the other side of it, I don't think we always realize it's happening. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's very deceiving in a way. In my so de- yeah, it's so deceiving. So what are some of the ways we can learn to identify that before engaging with other people who... That's an illness, right? It's actually... Um, a form of mental illness. It is, yes. And very often it goes with, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, like depression or, uh, you know, other other bits and pieces might go with it. Do you know, how do we recognize it? Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all, all, all we can do is, uh-huh. I think we as uh-huh. as individuals and as a, as a society need to be looking out for ourselves and for each other. Yeah. You know, in, in my case... You know, in my late 40s, I would get so upset about what was going on and upset about the things that I would be sent and messages and phone calls. And it took somebody to sit me down and do this wonderful um, exercise with me where I had to imagine I was standing behind myself 
and I had to give myself a really stern talking to. And it was about, you know, things like, well, you don't have to answer the phone if he's calling. You don't have to respond to the email that he sent you. Little things like that and just slowly just start taking back some of the control uh, so that it doesn't affect us that much. But to to spot it in somebody, I think, is very, very difficult because they can be so charming. Control is a sign, isn't it, Pat? That yeah. would let us yeah. know if we are aware of and attentive. It's easy yeah. to tell. But, you know, we, we don't, you know, luckily we don't grow up with um, a list of look out for the following things and don't mm-hmm. go near, <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we're not given a manual. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And <laughs> very, very often, you know, you, you meet, <laughs> you fall in love and the next thing, you know, a year or so down the line, suddenly you can't see your friends anymore mm-hmm. because he or she won't allow it. And it creeps up so slowly it takes us totally by surprise. And at which point we could be so wound up in that, are we now too scared to do anything? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's difficult. And, you know, we can't give people a manual. And, you know, sadly, most of us, I think, learn by trial and error yeah. and, and, and a lot of pain along the way. Um, but all of that, you know, whatever the pain might be, you know, if we if we are able to, extricate ourselves from that situation we can heal yeah we can definitely heal so today what is your understanding of healing what is to be healed is there such a thing i think it's uh oh it it comes there's a bit of a process i think um you can't heal from something if you don't admit to yourself that it's there in the first place so i use a metaphor a lot where you know, somebody with anxiety, I say, just imagine there's somebody knocking at your door. You don't have to open your door immediately, but you need to acknowledge that somebody's knocking on the door. You could then go and look from the upstairs window, who is it? At which point you decide if you're going to let them in or not. Now, the same happens with with anything that we, that is, I hate the word wrong, but you know what I mean? That's wrong. Is We've got to admit to ourselves firstly, okay, there is something which is not healthy. And if you don't acknowledge it, you can't deal with it. So now that I know it's there, now that I know there's something knocking at the front door and it wants to come in, I've now got to find the means to decide, am I going to leave it outside? Am I going to bring it in? Or am I going to open the door and say, I know you're there, but this isn't convenient. Can you come back at some other time? And at which point I can then do some work on myself So when they do come back, I can let them in safely, knowing I can control the situation. Or when they do come back, I simply don't let them in. And that's part of the healing process. Right. You've got to know it's there. You've got to know what it is. Otherwise, you don't know what to heal. And then, if need be, you get the help that you need to learn, right, now what do I do so that... I can answer that door with confidence Mm. or deny entry with confidence. Is there a a healing process or cure for narcissistic personality disorder? Well, (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would hope that if it is something which is identified really, really early in life, that it's possible. But unfortunately, the, the dealings I've had is age is a barrier in that it's in such an ingrown habitual way of being that I can't see any difference being made. All we can do is protect ourselves. But I th- I think you will find that there are, you know, people who are much cleverer than I am who will say to you, there are ways that we can lessen the symptoms so that that person is possibly not as potentially damaging to to their loved ones. Whether it can be healed or not, I can't answer that. The causes, do you have an idea about the causes for that? And I know there are other similar disorders like psychopathy. If we had to dig around, I think we probably would find that there are causes. And I would say they're probably going to go back to our child, you know, childhood is such a formative time, yeah. and so much can can 
you know, go wrong by accident or, you know, by, you know, toxic parents or toxic upbringings or a toxic world in which you were living. So I think there probably are things that were contributing factors. I'm not somebody who, I, I, I don't believe that our genetics are programmed that we are going to turn out to be somebody, you know, who's a you know, full-blown narcissist. I, I do think things happen along the way that might result in somebody developing those traits. I mean, if you, if you are a child and you're maybe totally left to your own devices with no parental input, mm. no parental guidance um, or guidance from any other significant adult, you might end up thinking my way of dealing with the world is the only way of dealing mm. with the world. It's the right way of dealing with the world. Right, right. right. You know, and that yeah. could be a reason behind it. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah, yeah. It's a tricky one. It's a really tricky one. One of the things that I learned to do in life is to protect myself, one, it's very important, and not to judge. That has helped a lot. And show love no matter what. Yeah, we need to understand before we judge. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I think, you know, there's that wonderful line, uh, is it in To Kill a Mockingbird, where she says, you know, you don't understand somebody till you walk inside their shoes, I think, she, or get inside their skin. I can't remember. She she basically says you can't understand somebody if you don't try and and really get inside who they are and what their world means and how their world functions. Yeah. Um, and I find so often with my my um, clients is that's exactly what we are doing. We are really trying to get this person to understand themselves. And once they understand themselves, they can then walk around with a big smile on their face. We're almost at the end, but I do have another topic that I read in one of your blog posts, is the human givens approach. And I mm, talked yeah. briefly off record. So talk to me for a moment about that. Okay, so the um, the human givens approach, which is what I qualified in, is a short term solution focused mode of therapy. Uh, what it aims to do is to make me as a therapist redundant as quickly as possible. So, in other words, where you as the client are able to move ahead um, as quickly as possible. So it, it, it draws on all sorts of different schools of psychotherapy and picks out what they believed are the best bits. So you, you'll find, you know, elements of cognitive behavioral therapy in the kind of work we do. We use um, hypnosis or guided imagery mm. regularly. We try and get to the essence of, you know, we spoke about emotional needs earlier. Um, where do you fit on that emotional needs audit? What of which of your emotional needs aren't being met in a healthy way? And then we look at your environment. Um, uh, we look at, you know, is the environment toxic? Are you missing any coping skills? And then from that, we become very goal directed and we work towards achieving those goals. And it is so powerful. It's very, very, it's a wonderful method to deal with trauma. We use a technique called the rewind technique, which is sort of going back and visiting a trauma, but in a very, very relaxed frame of mind, um, just to try and, we, you know, this, we never try and get rid of the memory. What you know, We're not going to do that. But we try and just tweak the emotional memory that goes with that memory so that the memory itself no longer is a trigger for you. Um, and it's it's a, such a powerful technique. Um, it's used so effectively on war veterans here in the UK with a, a, a charity called P a PTSD Resolution. And they use human given therapists, I think, exclusively because the success rate is so good. It's, it's a wonderful model. It's a really interesting model. Um, if you just type in um, wow. human givens into, into Google, um, it'll probably take you straight to their website. And it is a wonderful, wonderful system. I know that they have actually started training in the in the in the states. Oh, really? I never heard about it's only, it. No, yeah. It's, it's only been around for maybe twenty five years, I think. Yeah. So it's relatively new, but it's growing slowly. Uh, but it's a wonderful system. So I love uh, hypnotherapy. So that being part of the process, that also makes a lot of sense when it comes to the results and the effectiveness. 
Yeah. And, you know, I use it quite a lot with my teenage clients. Yeah. And because it's a, it's a system which demands imagination from the client. Mm. So, you know, we, I, I take them on these wonderful imaginative walks or hot air balloon rides. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And all the way through this, you know, they are imagining and picturing things. And I rely on the senses a lot. And the kids love it. I can imagine. <laughs> and it yeah. makes a massive difference to them. You know, for exam, when, you know, come exam time when they get so wound up, mm-hmm. one or two sessions like that, and they are different people mm-hmm. going to the exams with confidence. They know what to do if they suddenly get really nervous in the exam, how within minutes they can calm themselves down and get back to what they need to do. It's an incredibly powerful technique. I love your work, Pat. Thank you. Oh, I love doing it. I absolutely love doing it. For being aware of that and the commitment you have. It's really I can hear in your voice, that passion and that commitment. That's beautiful. Yeah, the, the, um, uh, I think somewhere on my website, I've written a blog on how I use the principles of human-given psychotherapy in my classroom. Oh, wow. And, you know, there's a, yeah. there's a, there's a format, there's a model, and in a classroom, it works. And, you know, so many of us who, who have been teaching for a long time, we're using some of these techniques without even realizing it. Right. Whereas the clever people have gone and done the research and they show us how it works. We just took it for granted. But now we know, it's, you know, it's, it's science. It works. Yeah, I'll look into it in the United States because I never heard about it. Not yet. But you're saying it's already being explored here. It's already being... Yes. Yeah, they have definitely started doing some teaching over there. It probably all came to a grinding halt because of COVID. Right, um, yeah. But they were definitely going over there and doing nice big blocks of teaching for, for those who were interested. I can't remember where, actually. Uh, if you want me to, I can go and dig it out and I'll send you an email with some of the details. That would be wonderful. I would love to include a link probably of your blog posts or any other links, useful yeah, links, please. please. Yeah, yeah. But I, I will see if I can find out when last they were in America and if they're planning to go again. Um, I think once once this mad, crazy world we're living in settles down, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they'll, they'll start up again. We're almost at the end, but I do have a few more questions for you. Those are the ending questions. I want to ask you this question about freedom. What is your idea of freedom, Pat? What is to be free from your perspective? Well, freedom's in the mind. I'll come back to an image I use with my with my school kids. You know, school in this country, most schools, the, the kids are wearing a uniform. And in some schools, they're really formal. You know, it's trousers and a tie and a jacket. And they moan like hell about the uniforms. And I say to them, look, it's just a uniform. And a school can say to you, that's what you have to wear. But the school can't control what's going on between your ears. Mm. And that's freedom. Right. right. You know, I can, I've got to go to work at a certain time. I've got no choice about that. Um, I've got to teach a particular Shakespeare. I've got no choice about that. But I can choose how I'm going to teach it. And that's freedom. Right. So we just, I think, have to understand that we all function within a society. We've got no choice. It's how we respond to that. There's the freedom. I love your wisdom. Yes. Yeah. Especially passing that on to young people, kids. That's so crucial. Well, you know, I've got to wear a uniform to school. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, this, I'm expected to dress in a certain way. Yeah. It's relatively casual. I'm really lucky at the school I teach and the, 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 and the school I teach now, they, the kids are in their own, they, you know, they're in their own clothes. But even when I taught at the schools where the, the kids' uniforms were rigid, I was expected to be in a tie. That's a uniform. Mm-hmm. And in a way, we, we could see it when we are forced to wear certain clothes at school. What they're really doing is showing us out there in the big wide world, whatever career you do, there's a dress code of some sort, whether it's you know, the wacky hairdresser with mm-hmm. dyed hair. And you know, what, that's a uniform that we expect. True. So it's no different, really. Yeah. Two more questions for you. If you knew you would die soon, meaning leave in the body, would you make any change or do anything in a different way? No. Oh, that was fast. <laughs> no. yeah. I'm perfectly happy with the way I live. I wouldn't make any changes. I mean, if they said to me, 
going to die tomorrow if you carry on eating potatoes. I'll stop eating <laughs> potatoes. But, oh. um, you know, yeah. but no, there's yeah. there's nothing that I would change. I um, I think I'm at an age now where I've made all those mistakes already and I'm now living in a way that I'm quite comfortable with. And my last question is, what are three things about life that you know for sure? As three things moment? that I know of life as for sure. Right, Life's going to throw things at you that are going to be difficult. We all know that. Right, right. But we also know that ultimately we can deal with all those difficulties. Maybe not on our own, but a, a hurdle, an obstacle is something which we all can learn how to overcome. Um, and the way I, you know, I use that in, in class with my, with my, the kids I teach, where, you know, they panic and exam, you know, they just see exams as walls. And I go, no, 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 it's not a wall. An exam is simply a gate that you are opening to the next opportunity. It's not a, it's not a wall, it's an opportunity. So those two things, I think that uh, life's going to throw us some rubbish occasionally, but we can deal with it. And the other thing that is sure is, I'm just looking out my window now, yeah. and that's sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah, I think it's, you know, we all need a bit of sunshine, whether it's real or metaphorical. It's, it's always there. Sometimes you've got to go and look for it, but it's often just hiding behind a cloud and it will pop out again. Yeah. I love the way you say these things, this uh, deep wisdom. <laughs> it's fun to listen to you. Thank you so much, Pat. Pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs> and before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your work, services, and future projects? Um, so I've got a website, and it's uh, patcapel.co.uk, all, uh, Pat Capel's all lowercase. And that's where I've got information about me, uh, the kind of work I do. Um, there's some blogs on there, things that I write. Um, so that's probably the best place to go. If you want to know more about the field or the the, the, um, uh, the style of therapy I use, then I would suggest go and Google um, human givens, human as in you know human being and givens, G-I-V-E-N-S. And that will explain the philosophy behind the style of practice, the research they've done. There's so much on there, really, really interesting stuff. Um, they've got some gorgeous books out on sort of self-help books on anxiety, depression, pain, anger, and they really are worth reading. So that's, yeah, those would, I would say would be the two places to go and dig around. It's on my website and then the Human Givens website. Thank you so much again and we'll talk soon. Yes, thank you. <laughs> bye for now, Pat. Cheers, bye. bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Pat Cappell and his work, please visit patcappell.co.uk. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.